probably know her, but if not, I'll just briefly um, highlight some facts. She is, of course, a legal scholar. Um, she's an Oxford woman. Um, she came to the EUI in 2001, where she first was a professor of commercial law. Is that correct? No, that was in London. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, she was yeah. a professor of law of some sort when she came to the EUI in 2001. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she also served as the department head of the law and, indeed, as president of the institute, something I know particularly because Maurice hired me, for which I'm very grateful. Um, she is a member and an editor of practically everything, has more books and journal articles you can shake a stick at, so I'm not going to try to give you a list. Um, she's an expert on EU law, particularly including both commercial and private law, and she's going to talk today about the global reach of EU law. The EU is an international legal actor, and I'm guessing that there's some, some of her fellow countrymen um, and country women in high government positions um, who might pay attention to this talk if they were here because they seem to think that saying the words Brexit, Brexit, Brexit over and over again will free them from the reaches of EU law. But anyway, I think we'll hear, we'll hear more about the reaches of that law today. Thank you, Maurice. The floor is yours. Thanks, David. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't think they're taking much legal advice, these people. <laughs> to be honest, from what I from what I can tell, they're not taking any advice, but certainly not legal advice. Um, anyway, it's it's great it's great to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me, and uh, it's really nice to be back and use this as an opportunity to also see the Sala Europa again, which is uh, one of my old haunts. So this uh, talk is really based on a on a chapter in a book. Um, that Joanne Scott and I have uh, put together for the Academy of European Law. Um, it came out of, of one of the Academy summer schools on this general theme. Um, and uh, we're looking at the um, operation of EU law beyond its territorial borders. And as part of that, um, this chapter in particular, but other chapters as well, uh, are, are considering the relation between law and EU external policy. Um, I found uh, in, a, in the forward to a, to a book on general principles of EU law recently a comment by uh, the former Advocate General Francis Jacobs, who's, who said, um, and this is a view which I think many, many would share, that the EU is based exclusively on law, not on power. Um, well, it, that may be true, um, but in a way, I think our book, um, and, and, and I would want to explore the possibility that in its external relations, in its international relations, we can also see law as power. Um, and, and that, in a way, is a theme. Um, so today, what I, what I want to do is explore the ways in which uh, and for what purposes the EU uses law as power um, in its external relations, and concomitantly, the ways in which law shapes the EU's external action. Um, we could argue, I think, and I would want to argue, that the EU derives its external power from law. It's constituted by law, and it operates through law. Its autonomous identity, both internally, in other words, with respect to its member states, and uh, externally, with respect to the rest of the world, is defined in terms of a legal order. What, does, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I'd want to highlight um, two things, two aspects of that. The first is that the, um, the court uh, defines the EU's specific characteristics as including those relating to the constitutional structure of the EU, um, including the principles of conferral of powers and the institutional framework. This legal structure establishes the EU's international capacity and its external powers, the institutional framework through which those powers are exercised, and what the court calls the structured network of principles, rules, and mutually interdependent legal relations linking the EU and its member states and its member states with each other. And these, this structured network of principles and rules enable and govern its external action. So in pursuing its interests and values as the EU is enjoined to do um, by Article 3 
paragraph 5 of the um, Treaty on European Union, the EU is constrained procedurally by its institutional legal framework and substantively by the need to ensure compliance with its own constitutional principles, including the protection of fundamental rights and the rule of law. Even in those areas of external activity which, we, uh, which may seem to be the least uh, subject to the control of the court, such as a common foreign and security policy, are subject to these legal constitutional constraints. So that's one dimension um, of, of arguing that the EU is in, uh, operates internationally as, in a sense, a legal order. The second dimension of this is that it is as a legal order that the EU relates to the outside world and the boundary between what is internal and what is external to that order is a legal one. The EU deploys its external instruments to extend the impact um, of EU legislation beyond uh, its territorial boundaries, leveraging the power of the Union to act internally um, so that that power is projected externally. So if it is through law that the EU, we may say, constructs itself as an international actor. How is that reflected in its international action and what role does law actually play? What kind of international legal actor is the EU? And I want to look at three dimensions of this, three different dynamics, which are not entirely separate from each other, but which I think give different perspectives. Um, the first one is... Uh, the way in which law mediates between the EU and its external partners to develop that idea a bit. The way in which the EU uses law as a way of conducting its foreign policy and as a way of promoting its interests. Of course, the EU is not alone in doing this, but it is a distinctive element in EU external activity. Uh, it includes the employment of international agreements, bilateral and multilateral, as well as the use of external legal instruments, um, including international law and its own legal norms as reference points or benchmarks in developing its relations with third countries. And um, beyond that, these relations with third countries are consistently framed in terms of economic and legal integration. Um, I think it's... it's um, something I would argue that the building of the EU as an integration project has an external as well as an internal quality. Insofar as law constructs the framework for integration-based relationships, integration through law can be seen as an external relations enterprise as well as something internal to the EU. Um, and further to that again, uh, in constructing those relationships, law also defines the boundary between internal and external. And indeed, you could say that uh, establishing that boundary is a necessary part of defining the EU's autonomous identity in relation to other actors. So the first um, aspect I want to look at then is this idea of um, the integration dimension and law as structuring the EU's relationships with third countries. Second, I want to look at the um, EU as a regulatory actor, externally as well as um, internally, with a commitment to what the treaty um, frames as multilateral solutions to common problems, good global governance an actor which is engaged in shaping, importing, and promoting international legal norms. So the EU treaties instruct uh, the EU to contribute to the development of international law, in particular in the framework of the United Nations. And we can see this in, uh, we, we can see this in a number of, of different examples. Um, Later on, I'm going to look at um, money laundering as an example, but we can also see it in a, the broader policy context of the European neighbourhood policy, um, where the um, EU promotes the ratification of key international conventions by 
uh, neighborhood policy partners supporting international institutions and the implementation and enforcement of uh, ratified conventions, as well as enlisting the support of its ENP partners in furthering its own multilateral legal agenda. We could also um, take as an example the trade and sustainable development chapters in the EU's most recent uh, free trade agreements, which are designed to ensure that the trade between the parties takes place in compliance with international commitments on social and environmental protection and to promote those international standards more broadly. Um, and then the third uh, dimension is to examine the role that law plays in the construction of the EU's international legal presence as, as a union of values. To what extent is law used to promote EU values externally? To what extent does it act as a constraint, ensuring that the EU upholds its values, including human rights norms and its external relations? Um, and, and part of that, I think, is looking at whether or not we can really reconcile um, the uh, claim that the Union has made that, it, that its values and its interests can be reconciled. Um, can we, it, it, is that really borne out um, in the external relations of the EU? Um, okay. I think... Uh, Let's start with the, um, the first one, the, the question of um, law, law and integration law. law uh, the EU is an integration project which is external as well as internal. Um, integration, of course, has been, is the basis of the EU's own development and the EU's own enlargement. And I, th I think in a real sense you could argue that the EU sees progress in its relations with third countries and especially with its neighbours as progress in integration. And its mode of integration, uh, is externally as well as internally, is through law. Um, extending the reach of the EU acquis through international agreements while maintaining the distinction uh, between the two. Um, I think this is one of the more powerful tools in the EU's external relations toolbox, if you like, um, and it's used to develop close relations with, the, uh, with its neighbours, reflect, reflecting a mix of values and interests, and even in some cases creating a new legal space. And yet, the EU's legal identity also ensures that the boundary between inside and outside remains distinct. Non-members may become almost members, and members may become non-members, but there are legal constraints on the integration that the EU can embrace in its international relationships, and it's the law that calibrates those distances. Um, we can take two examples, concluded 20 years apart and in very different contexts, the European Economic Area Agreement of 1994 and the Association Agreement with Ukraine concluded in 2014. Neither of these agreements envisages an accession track for the partner countries. They're not explicitly designed to prepare countries for accession, but rather to provide an advanced form of integration without membership. And so, in my view, they provide an important test case, or both test cases, of the EU's ability to create successful integration-based relations with its regional neighbours, um, which is what Article 8 of the Treaty on the European Union requires it to do. Um, the legal regimes that these two agreements create are derived from the international agreements on which they're based. So this isn't, isn't simply a case, or isn't a case, in fact, of extraterritorial application of the EU acquis. It is instead the creation of a new legal relation, or acquis, such as, for example, EEA law, which to some extent reflects EU law, and which, but which will be implemented through the domestic legal orders of the contracting parties. Against this background of um, convergence of norms between the partner countries and the EU, the parties agree to reciprocal market integration, the degree of integration reflecting the degree of norm convergence. 
to some extent, the legal techniques used in the EEA um, and the Ukraine agreement are similar, but they pose different questions um, as we consider what it means to say that we are extending the acquis to third countries and the flexibility of the EU's external law of integration. So, um, as you will all know, the impetus behind the EEA is the desire of a number of close neighbours to take part in EU economic integration while remaining outside the EU. Um, having said that, it, you could argue that the EEA actually contains a strong integration momentum itself um, in that a number of the original parties to the EEA are now member states. Um, uh, so that what was originally seen as a, as a, as a sort of long-term integration without membership for some states has become, in fact, a route to membership. It's, the EEA is based on um, two principles the principles of homogeneity and dynamism. Homogeneity meaning that the EEA and its annexes are intended to mirror provisions of primary and secondary EU law, particularly the four freedoms. It, it's a selective homogeneity. It doesn't cover the whole of the EU acquis. Um, and some of the non-EEA um, integra uh, non integration including the Schengen uh, Agreement, is covered by side agreements. Um, so that those parts of the uh, EEA integration, such as free movement of, of people, um, which are particularly affected, um, can, can maintain a high degree of homogeneity. And there are provisions in the EEA on um, the, uh, uh, providing for the um, EFTA court to follow the rulings um, of the, um, of the EU courts um, and to, date, to, to, to be bound by rulings which um, were adopted before the coming into force of the EA and to take account of rulings which were adopted subsequently. Um, the concept of dynamism uh, refers to the continuing updating of the annexes so that they continue to track developments in EU secondary law. So, um, I think, and I think, um, I, I, th I think one could argue that central to the uh, conception of the EEA is the objective of ensuring equality of treatment of individuals and economic operators throughout the whole of the EEA. Um, if we look at a couple of examples from the um, on the on the side of the EFTA Court on the one hand, the side of the European Court of Justice on the other. On the side of the EFTA court, um, one of the characteristics of the jurisprudence of the EFTA court has been the way in which it's managed to incorporate some of the unwritten principles of EU constitutional law, even though they were not spelt out in the EA agreement, including, um, for example, the uh, doctrine of state liability, the so-called Frankovich um, doctrine. But I think it's also um, very striking the way in which the EFTA court has responded to changes in EU primary law which have not been reflected in the EA agreement, for example, the introduction of EU um, citizenship and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So the, there's been no attempt to um, incorporate the, con the concept of EU citizenship into the EA, but the EFTA court has managed to interpret the, um, the so-called Citizens Directive, the Free Movement Directive 2004-38, um, in such a way as to mirror um, the case law of the European Court of Justice on um, the, effectively on the rights of EU citizens. Um, and, and what I find interesting about this is that the, what the EFTA Court is doing is, is in some cases departing from the reading given by the um, European Court of Justice of that directive in order to ensure that the, um, uh, the result is a homogeneity of treatment between EA national, EFTA nationals and EU citizens. So it, 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 it interprets the directive in a way which the Court of Justice does not but in order to achieve a homogeneity of result, that, 
Court of Justice has got the citizenship provisions in the treaty to rely on, which the EFTA Court does, doesn't have. So there are some st striking examples of the way in which the courts have, or the EFTA Court has in this way, promoted homogeneity, in particular in the area of individual rights. When it comes to the European Court of Justice, I think you can also find examples of the way in which um, it sees the EEA as an integrated legal space. Um, in a, a well-known case where, the, where there was a challenge to the appropriate legal basis of um, a council decision updating the annexes, um, in this case, annexes on social security for um, uh, migrant workers within the EEA, um, the court uh, insisted that it was not the proper legal base for this um, decision, was not the provision in the EU treaties on the migration of third country nationals, it was the provision on, the, on intra EU free movement of EU nationals even though what, was that, what we were actually talking about was extending these rules to um, EFTA state nationals in the context of the EEA. And the court explicitly contrasts EU immigration policy with the EEA, which is based on reciprocity and equality of treatment, saying that the, the point of this um, uh, introduction of the new social security regulation would be to establish a social security um, regime not only for EFTA nationals in the EU, but also for EU nationals in the EFTA state parties, um, and thus throughout the whole of the um, EEA. So this is what I have in mind when I talk about the EEA as, as its own legal, legal space. Um, but of course, as we know, there are, there are limits uh, to this integration. Although the court talks about the EFTA states as being placed on the same footing as member states, they're not member states. They don't participate in EU decision-making. And um, the, uh, when the EEA was originally set up, the Court of Justice insisted on, this, on having a two-pillar approach of having a separate EFTA court and EFTA surveillance authority and not any kind of integrated institutional structure. So in terms of institutional structures, we still have a clear separation uh, between the, um, the two regimes. And on, on the part of the EFTA states as well, um, EA, EA law does not take effect directly in the EFTA states. Um, F, EA law doesn't require um, uh, a direct effect, if you like. The legal boundary remains clear as well as the institutional boundary between EU law and um, EEA law. Um, the, uh, in terms of the uh, turning to the uh, U Ukraine association agreement, I think um, uh, one of the, um, the first point that I would want to make about that is that the purpose of the agreement is very different. Actually, the purpose of the agreement, as many of you are probably aware, is, is quite ambiguous, particularly in terms of integration. There's a lot of talk in the preamble to the agreement about integration with the EU. There's no specific mention of accession, but there are some, many of the techniques that are used are techniques which are, in a sense, borrowed from um, the accession dynamic um, or pre-accession dynamic um, uh, of the of the 1990s um, and 2000s, and 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 so there and there is a real ambiguity um, uh, in the um, uh, in the uh, in the integration objective. Where, where is the finalité of this agreement? Is not uh, is not particularly clear. Um, I think uh, what we can say, looking at the uh, looking at the agreement. Um, is that the integration has uh, the inter integration um, dynamic of the agreement has two um, aspects to its objective. The first one would be um, integration or uh, and the integration into the EU legal model and the regulatory model as a form of uh, uh, modernisation. 
um, for, the, for Ukraine. But there's another aspect as well, which is um, designed more to serve EU interests in the neighbourhood, Not notably um, support for uh, foreign policy and security objectives. And here I think um, there's a real contrast um, in the sense that the, um, as the scope of activities of the EU externally as well as internally have grown to include um, wider foreign policy and um, national and international security concerns, these are written into the um, integration aspect of the, of the Ukraine agreement. So um, it, it, it talks about ever closer convergence between Ukraine and the EU on positions um, of bilateral, regional, and multilateral, multilateral or international issues of mutual interest. Um, so uh, it's not just about economic transition, but also about um, commitments from Ukraine to align itself to EU foreign policy in, on, on, on a number of issues, WMD, arms control, also counter-terrorism, cooperation on migration, border management, etc. So the CFSP, AFSJ dimensions um, are there in the, um, in the, in the agreement. Um, a second contrast between the uh, Ukraine agreement and the EA agreement is the uh, use of conditionality. And conditionality is built in even to the economic integration aspects, or pr even primarily, one might say, into the economic integration aspects of the, um, of the agreement. Of the, in other words, progress in economic integration. It depends on the degree to which Ukraine aligns its law um, to that of the um, EU. There is a, a specific market access conditionality built into the agreement. Um, moving on to look at the um, the second dynamic that I want to uh, that I want to address: the EU as a regulatory actor. Um, the uh, I, I said I was going to um, use money laundering as an example, um, and what I what I. What, why I think this is an interesting example, it certainly isn't the only one that one could, that one could use, is that um, it, it shows the interrelationship between external, internal and external norm making, as well as between unilateral, bilateral and multilateral norm making. So um, this is why I think it gives a different, a, a different perspective. External agreements here may be seen as a way of ensuring that as many countries as possible accept global norms and that these norms are at least compatible uh, with and at best reflect um, the EU's own, own approach to governance and security and its relationship to fundamental rights. Um, so for, firstly, um, the first point to make uh, on this is the way in which the EU seeks to ensure that um, uh, the, in the negotiation of new international norms, uh, that those international norms are compatible with and to some extent reflect its own uh, legal positions. So, um, for example, um, the uh, when negotiating the uh, Palermo Convention um, in 2000, which is the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, it was concerned to ensure this consistency, particularly, for example, in the definition of organized crime, that that would um, uh, mesh with the definition adopted by the EU in uh, a 1998 joint action. And it um, adopted, there was a, a joint position adopted uh, ensuring that, the, that that was going to coordinate the member states' negotiating positions, which had as one of its um, purposes to in, avoid incompatibility between the proposed convention and instruments drawn up by the EU. Uh, so this is, this is just one example. And, and in relation to money laundering more specifically, 
that member states were supposed to ensure that provisions, the provisions um, should not be inconsistent with and should take account of the EU's existing measures on, on money laundering, as well as being consistent with the recommendations from the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF. Um, and in fact, the text of the Palermo Convention uh, on the definition of organised crime does follow the pre-existing EU position. And what happened then is that the formulation used in Palermo is then adopted by the EU in its um, subsequent internal legislation, um, a 2008 framework decision which replaced the 98 joint action. Um, and so there is a, a, a play, an interrelation between the EU seeking to influence the formulation um, or at international level and then incorporating those formulations in its own internal uh, law. And we can see that also, uh, that the example I was giving was a convention, the Palermo Convention, but we can see that also with respect to the, um, the FATF recommendations on money laundering, which are soft law, they're not legally binding, but which are um, rigorously incorporated in successive generations of um, EU money laundering um, directives. Um, the, another um, aspect, a further aspect um, of this interrelationship is uh, the um, participation by the EU in international conventions alongside its member states um, which it sees as, um, among other things, as, as a means of ensuring that member state and EU implementation of these international commitments um, are convergent, are, are consistent with each other. So the EU will, will see its participation and then its um, implementation of international conventions alongside member states as a way of ensuring um, of, 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 of ensuring convergence, also of ensuring compliance with EU uh, general principles, including fundamental rights, e.g. data protection, uh, and also, um, as the EU would argue, ensuring a more um, consistent and um, enforceable if you like, implementation of those international commitments because if they, to the extent to which they are translated into internal EU law, they become uh, more enforceable against, in relation to the member states. Um, and so the, the EU would, would see itself as, in a, in a sense, promoting the international norm um, through participating not only in the negotiation of the convention but also um, through its implement, implementation but not only its implementation in its own member states but also um, third countries so in uh, in its bilateral relations um, the the EU will refer to these international standards including um, the FATF recommendations um, they incre increasingly you see references to um, uh, money laundering, among others. I'm just taking this as an example, um, in EU bilateral agreements. So that the Ukraine agreement that I was mentioning earlier um, provides for cooperation in combating money laundering, making reference to these, uh, the FATF standards, even though Ukraine is not actually a member of the FATF. And the Ukraine Association Agenda, which is a soft law instrument, includes implementation of the Palermo Convention and other UN and Council of Europe conventions, implementation of the FATF standards and EU anti-money laundering uh, directives. So this is in the neighbourhood, but the same um, happens in a slightly, perhaps a moderated way, but nevertheless significant way in uh, relations beyond the neighbourhood. For example, the agreement on partnership and cooperation with the Philippines has provisions in it on 
uh, terrorism, um, including um, and, and money laundering, combating organized crime and corruption, um, referring again to these um, international standards, including the FATF recommendations, even though, again, Philippines is not actually a member of the FATF. So we can see the, 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 the way in which the EU is promoting these um, international standards. Um, I think uh, th this, this dynamic of, of, of um, uh, contributing to the formulation of international standards, incorporating them internally, and then projecting them externally through bilateral agreements as well as through um, uh, unilateral uh, internal legislation towards its member states is, is, a, is very characteristic of the way in which the EU is, um, operates in these, reg in these regulatory spheres. I think um, I'd, wa I'd want to raise um, a, a couple of points. One of the um, uh, arguments that the EU has used in, in, uh, in, in this context has been that by participating in these um, in these external regulatory, uh, this external regulatory norm creation, the EU can ensure that um, there is, as I've said, consistency with its own uh, approach, but in particular, consistency with its own fundamental rights. And um, I, I just, there, there are just two questions, I think, that one might um, uh, address on that. The, the, the EU argues that in importing international norms, it ensures that they comply with its own fundamental rights standards. But um, I, I'm not sure that, in, in theory, that, that of course is the way it should be. In practice, it doesn't necessarily um, work like that. Um, the, uh, there is this um, recent decision of the, of the Court of Justice that the uh, proposed agreement on passenger name records on PNR data with Canada does not fully comply with EU data protection standards. Um, the adoption of the internal PNR directive within the EU uh, was held up in the European Parliament for a long time over concerns over data, data protection. Um, the Schrems case um, illustrates the difficulty of assessing equivalence of uh, fundamental rights protection um, in a third country, um, and as well as the need to keep it under review. Um, so from this perspective, I think it's interesting that the court in that case on the um, PNR agreement with Canada uh, was prepared to uh, analyze the agreement in great detail, uh, but also to set out a series of um, uh, prescriptions, essentially, that uh, uh, when it would be necessary in order to bring the agreement into line with internal um, data protection standards of the EU. So the court was giving guidance, if you like, for the um, adjusting of the agreement to bring it into line. Um, so I, th I think there are questions over the extent to which the EU really does translate um, or in implement these international commitments um, in a fundamental rights compliant way. But there's also, there are also signs um, that the Court of Justice is prepared to, uh, to step in on this, and I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But um, the second point to make on, on, this, uh, on this issue is, um, is the question um, of, is, is, is this question. If the EU engages in international standard setting or norm creation through an international instrument, um, maybe for one that, um, let's say for the sake of argument, includes provision for uh, criminal sanctions. If that um, international instrument does not itself contain uh, due process safeguards, um, the EU will tend to reassure its own public by saying, don't worry, when we implement this convention within the EU, we will incorporate, we will ensure that our implementation meets our high um, human rights standards, our, our own fundamental rights, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, 
um, and so on. So as long as the agreement doesn't actually compel action which is non-human rights compliant, the EU will claim there's no problem. Um, and certainly it's true that in its own implementation, the EU would be bound um, to, uh, to comply with its own fundamental rights standards. But the, 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 there is a problem, or the, the, we might argue that there's a problem with an, agreements which um, permit good practice but don't require it, um, with agreements which uh, require the adoption of enforcement provisions while failing to specify clearly the corresponding safeguards, due process safeguards. Um, and it, 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 it may be fine for parties where, which have strong constitutional fundamental rights safeguards at the domestic level, but not all parties will necessarily do that. So if you want to put the question um, that, that, I, that, I, that, that I want to put a little bit crudely, you could, uh, you could say if the EU wants to upload or seeks to upload its preferred regulatory standards to the international level, encouraging their adoption by third countries, including transitional economies, should it not also seek to build in fundamental rights protection? But there is a problem with this, because if, 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 you, really, if, you, if, you, if you do argue that, then every regulatory convention or agreement turns essentially into a, a human rights uh, agreement. And, and that has its own problems and its own difficulties. So I'm not offering an answer to that question, but I think it is a question which the EU needs to, needs to face when it is, um, as it were, playing the role of um, the upholder of fundamental rights. And that's um, the final point I'm um, coming, to the, coming to the end. The final point I want to make um, is, uh, is about the, the union as, a, as, as a, a union of values, if you like, and what does it, it can we, uh, what, what does it mean to say that the EU has a commitment, as Article 3, Paragraph 5 says, to uphold and promote its values and interests, um, as well as contributing to the protection of human rights. Um, and I, I think there is um, an, an, an interesting dynamic here between, uh, in the idea of upholding and promoting its values and interests. One, one might argue that there is an inherent, um, uh, there is an inherent rivalry almost between values and interests. You see values as, as law and interests as power, if you like, that, that they, they are likely to be pulling in different directions. The EU recently has tried hard to, to persuade itself, at any rate, um, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Mogherini's global strategy, that values and interests are, in fact, in, in, in fact not um, in contradiction with each other or in tension with each other. Um, in fact, the global strategy argues that the e EU's interests lie in its values. Um, so it says that interests and values go hand in hand. We have an interest in promoting our values, but at the same time, our values are embedded in our interests. So this is very much a, a, a rhetorical, of course, statement, um, which is designed to, to, to show that the global strategy is reflecting um, in some kind of operational way, um, Article 3, Paragraph 5, um, the mission statement, the external mission statement, um, if you like, of, of the EU. But, uh, and, and it is primarily rhetorical, and I think, as, 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 as some people have argued, I think rightly, that there is a danger that um, emphasizing the interdependence of, of values and interests will lead to the EU shaping its values according to its current political interests. And I, I, th I think that is, a, that is a, a, an issue and it's a problem. And there, also, it's, of course, not difficult to find examples where values and interests are um, in tension and, and, and um, indeed in conflict. But nevertheless, I think what, what, what one can see is in, in um, a number of, of, of policy statements, recent policy statements, um, the, um, uh, an attempt at least to show that values and interests can be 
conform, conformable to each other, if you like. Um, you can see it in, in the EMP, the, more, the most recent documents on the EMP, where, whereas earlier documents were very much stressing exporting EU values, the more recent documents pay more attention to interests and, and shared interests as well as shared values. Um, the, uh, the, the most recent trade strategy um, uh, document of the, of the Commission uh, goes the other way in the sense that alongside interests it puts values um, uh, reflecting the trade strategy says the priorities of EU citizens so that um, trade should be uh, should go hand in hand with social justice respect for human rights high labor and environmental standards and this is in a part what is uh, reflected in the sustainable development chapters of the recent trade agreements. Um, the, um, I want, uh, finally, I, I, I think um, to, 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 to finish this, I, uh, what I would like to do is um, just say a couple of words about the, uh, the, the, um, the opinion 115 on the PNR agreement with Canada and the Polisario uh, case and, and, and the significance of those two cases. What, what we've had, in, in other words, what I'm, what I'm looking at is the operationalization of the idea that EU external relations should be based on its fundamental values, in particular, it's um, the protection of fundamental rights. Um, the, uh, in the, in the uh, opinion 115, which was on the um, PNR agreement with Canada, I've already said the court um, found it, that it engaged in a detailed analysis of the agreement. For the first time, this was actually the first opinion where um, the court addressed substantive compliance of an EU international agreement um, with, with EU law. Other, other, plenty of other opinions looking at... Um, uh, institutional problems, looking at competence issues, at legal basis, um, and so on. This is the first time that the court has said an international agreement of the EU has to comply with EU fundamental rights, um, and in particular, charter rights. And it's quite striking how, firstly, that the EU um, refers to the charter, even over and above Article 16 um, on data protection of the EC Treaty, so it really bases itself on on the Charter, and secondly, that it uses as its benchmarks um, intern the internal case law um, on, um, uh, on data protection, cases like Schrems. Um, the, so I, I think this is a significant case, and I, and I think we're, of course, all waiting for opinion um, 117 on the, on the CETA, which is also going to raise um, compliance with... Uh, with e substantive compliance with EU law, including, um, including fundamental rights. Um, but this, this case, I, th I think it's, it's, uh, it's significant. It's also significant that the court was prepared to set out in detail what needed to be done to put the agreement right in its view. Um, but this was a case concerning the fundamental rights, data protection rights of EU citizens whose data was being transferred to a third country. Um, and it had a very clear link to EU data protection legislation, of course. Um, what about the fundamental rights of citizens of third countries with which the EU proposes to engage? And this is where the, um, the Polisario case comes in. There have been earlier, um, there have been a, a, a couple of interesting decisions by the European Ombudsman on the administrative um, duty of, of the, um, particularly of the European Commission, to engage with the human rights impact of uh, projected trade agreements. Um, I won't spend time talking about those now, but I think it's, it's an, it's, that itself is an interesting development. But what about um, legal, the, um, the legal enforceability, as opposed to administrative, um, legal enforceability of uh, the uh, the conception that the EU is bound by um, 
fundamental rights in uh, negotiating trade agreements. And here you've got an, uh, an interesting um, difference between the position of the general court on the one hand and the position of the Court of Justice on the other. The, the position of the general court put very um, succinctly was that the EU um, was under a procedural duty. This is not about substantive compliance. It's a procedural duty, the general court says, to um, take account of, as one of the relevant factors in the council decision-making, to take account of the human rights impact of uh, a trade agreement. So in this case, it was the human rights of the peoples of the Western Sahara who would be affected by an agreement the EU was proposing to conclude, um, and indeed had concluded, with Morocco. So, and the General Court annulled the Council decision, concluding the agreement on the grounds that the Council had not taken account of the um, impact on the Charter rights, again, reference to the Charter, um, in the territory of the Western Sahara. Now, the and that uh, um, procedural duty uh, was uh, that the, the Court of Justice annulled the decision of the General Court, but not on that ground, on a different ground, which I'll come on to in a minute. The Advocate General in the case agreed with the General Court that there was this duty on the Council. We don't have a statement to that effect from the Court of Justice, but we don't have a denial of it either. Um, and I think building on the Ombudsman's decisions on administrative procedures, I, I think I, th I would want to make the argument that the EU does have this at least procedural obligation to take account of the impacts of its uh, trade agreements or other agreements um, on the populations of, of third countries. Um, but the Court of Justice, in annulling the judgment of the General Court, took a, a different angle, which is, I think, interesting in a different way, uh, which, which was to say, uh, we, in, in a sense, we don't have... Uh, the, the, which was to say that the agreement um, that the EU was concluding with Morocco did not apply at all to the territory of the Western Sahara. Why, and so it wasn't going to affect the fundamental rights of the peoples of the Western Sahara. Why did it not apply? Because um, if it had applied to the territory of the Western Sahara, the, the court said that would infringe the fundamental principle of international law um, of self-determination. Self and the fact that the um, EU had not recognized Moroccan um, uh, sovereignty over the territory of the Western Sahara um, the court used that as a, uh, a way, as, as a justification for interpreting uh, the agreement in such a way that it would not apply to this territory. So the Council and the Commission had taken the view that although there was a, a legal non-recognition um, of so sovereignty, nevertheless there was likely to be a de facto application. Um, but the court said we can't interpret this agreement in such a way that the EU would be in breach of fundamental Jus Kogan's principles, um, binding principles of international law. Um, so, in, so I think this is significant in the sense that we have here a very strong conforming interpretation principle. Um, the court is interpreting an agreement of the Union in such a way as to ensure that the EU takes seriously um, compliance with the fundamental norms of international law. Um, and I, in that sense, I would see it as, to some extent, a, a sister case with, um, with CADI. Uh, CADI. In CADI, the emphasis was on EU constitutional law. Here, the emphasis is on, if you like, international constitutional law or international Jus Kogans, um, the court saying we cannot interpret this agreement in such a way as to uh, lead to a conflict, um, or to, to this EU agreement conflicting, or this EU action in concluding the agreement, conflicting with the EU's obligations 
under um, uh, strict norms of international law. So, and in doing that, it makes reference to Article 3, Paragraph 5, and the need to respect international law. So we can see the beginnings, um, I think. It's only the beginning, but I think it's an encouraging sign that if you take these two cases together, the PNR case and Polisario case together, that the court is prepared to scrutinize EU action for fundamental rights compliance, external action, not only when it involves the rights of EU citizens, but also when it in, involves um, the position of, of third country nationals. Thank you. Okay, we're going we're gonna to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions now. There's quite a few people and there's limited time, so I'm going to be very fierce with you. You may ask one question, not three questions. We're going to go around the room, so don't raise your hand. Everybody will have an opportunity to speak and ask a question. And I'll ask you to try to keep your questions brief. So there's a certain tendency to make a long policy statement and then say, do you agree, or something like that. So I'll ask you to try to ask questions that are more directly relevant to the talk than that. Now, as I said, I'm going to go around the room. There's no sense in raising your hands. You'll, we'll get to you all in time. Um, Maurice, let me ask you a question, though, about your preference. Would you prefer to answer questions one at a time, or would you prefer that we accumulate three questions and then you give a response? Yeah, maybe accumulated a few. Three. Okay. All right. So we're going we're gonna to start at this side of the room and work our way around. So, Claire, if you'd like to have a question, you're first to go. And if not, you can pass, you can pass the torch until we have a – Bridget, I know, wants to go. But, Claire, you get the first shot. You can pass. Yeah, yeah. Use, use the mic, please. So thanks a lot, Maurice. Uh, we've had the opportunity to discuss uh, various iterations of um, some of the ideas in here. So I just want you, so a little bit, the presentation today of the argument is a bit values and interests for the EU are a bit like love and marriage, no? <laughs> they, that the EU both thinks they should go together like a horse and carriage and tries its best to make them do so. And you give some very compelling examples of that, like PNR, Polisario. But of course, we need to consider also important counterexamples. So I guess that's what I want to challenge you to do. And so, for example, what about the EU-Turkey agreement, uh, challenged by the uh, Mr. NF, who found himself a Pakistani national, who found himself at the rough end of that agreement while being stuck in Lesbos, and he challenged it. And how did the court m manage this tension between the EU's interests in getting rid of irregular migrants and their values, which certainly do not allow them to act in that way? They say, oh, the EU didn't do it. It was the member states that did it. So I just wonder to what extent do counterexamples challenge the narrative advanced uh, convincingly, and which is an, an important narrative too. I have two questions, possible, yes? <laughs> ha. Oh, only one. <laughs> My God. Okay, so I choose, I choose the simplest one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a pity, but okay. Um, so it's what's um, the wonderful analysis, all, all based on uh, the con judicial control by the European Court of Justice. It's just I was uh, wondering uh, uh, while you were presenting this, uh, if uh, in this aspect also the assembly, the parliament could have a role. I mean, if the assembly scrutiny could have a, a role in the uh, strengthening of this. Uh. So, uh, Maurice, you started by saying the EU saw itself as law, not power. But in a way, that's very self-serving for the EU because it's part of its self-definition. The EU is not a traditional power, it's a normative power. I don't buy it at all. The law is always about power in the EU and inevitably in the international system. Because I think one of the things that the EU tries to disguise is that it also is and can be a geopolitical actor. And when the geopolitics hit then law can be deployed in all sorts of ways, both 
to strengthen uh, the normative side, but also the interest. So I, I think, again, my question melds a little with what, uh, with what Claire said. I'm just going to say, we see here the political scientist and the lawyer. Okay, now the lawyer gets her turn. In the longer chapter, I have the um, EU-Turkey as, as, a, as a clear counterexample of, of the tension. And I, 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 I certainly am not trying, would, would never try to say that everything, everything is lovely. Um, uh, all I'm perhaps trying to do is show that what might be seen, have been seen as a purely utopian statement in Article 3, Paragraph 5, is beginning to show some teeth. And we, we we are beginning to see the court using it, um, uh, it, I wouldn't say aggressively exactly, but being prepared to use it. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how far it will go um, and how far the court will go. It'll be, it'll be very interesting to see. There are certainly plenty of counterexamples, and I think I, I take seriously this critique that says there's a real danger if you try and say there's no real distinction between values and interests that you end up defining, and this is a, a little bit into your, that you end up defining your values in such a way as to promote your interests. And I, I think quite a lot of that has, has, has actually been happening, but in a, it, perhaps not in a very articulated way. Um, in, in the earlier years of the, of the EMP, for example, um, where all the talk was of values, but actually the values that were being espoused were values that were in the EU's interests. Now, the, the rhetoric is perhaps a little bit more um, transparent in the sense that there is more, a more obvious, there are more references to our interests in the, in the policies documents than, the, than there were. So there's a bit more rail politic coming through perhaps there. But I, I absolutely, I mean, I, it, it, in, a, in a way, what I would want to, um, to argue is that the, the EU, I, I, th I think there is, a, um, it, it's a very interesting um, balance here that the EU on the one hand uses, uh, uses law to promote, uses law as power, that, that was my starting point, right? So it uses law if you look at the integration dynamic, if you look at the regulatory dynamic, that I was that I was looking at. You have law being used as as as, as an instrument um, of power, including geopolitical power. And I, um, one could one could certainly expand on that. Um, absolutely. Th th then you have this um, uh, other other dynamic coming in, and 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 the balance between them, of at the same time the the EU projecting itself projecting itself as, in, in, as value-driven um, and as, uh, as creating its, or seeking to create itself as an international actor for which legality, both constitutional legality and international law legality, are fundamental. Um, I, I also, I, I had a paragraph on the normative power in there, um, largely to say I don't really want to talk about the EU as a normative power, um, or at least if I do, it's normative, not in the sense in which Ian Manners uses it, but as uh, purely as, as, as using normative instruments, using, using, using law. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> fine. I'm sorry. I'll move. I mean, on the on the on the Parliament, I think um, absolutely. Um, you're you're absolutely right. The 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 role of the Parliament um, has become um, much more important in external policy in recent years. Um, not only because it now has to consent to international agreements, but of course that that's a big part of it. But if one's looking at the, um, just as an example, this um, uh, the ombudsman um, uh, um, 
inquiry into the agreement with Vietnam um, on the human rights impact assessment was preceded by um, uh, resolutions from the European Parliament deploring the fact that the um, Commission had not carried out impact assessments. The Parliament is much more is 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 quite willing these days to um, to seek to influence the direction of policy through the adoption of of, of resolutions, including um, while and during negotiations um, for international agreements. So the, 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 the conversation, if you like, um, with the European Parliament is, is I think, important. Um, so I, I agree. It's not something I, I dealt with here, but I, I think you're right. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maurice. Uh, very interesting uh, talk. Um, one uh, question about uh, um, you have looked very much in compliance, and when it comes to this uh, projection of values, exporting of values, if you want, uh, to what extent do you see uh, that there are mechanisms, uh, efficient mechanisms for follow on and for actually making these commitments work uh, after agreements are concluded? And do you see any risk? of a lot of projection of values uh, which are then um, kind of not really enforced or followed up, uh, is there any risk that there may be a backlash even uh, of uh, hollow? Uh, in international, yeah, this kind of proje pro pro projection as in the ag agreement in Ukraine, you mentioned uh, uh, and there are others. Uh, to what extent this can be, uh, in a certain extent, uh, go sometimes against values uh, if they are afterwards not complied with or, or um, they can remain hollow, in a sense, uh, uh, if you have any comment on that. Thanks very much, Maurice, for the lecture. Really fascinating. I'm struck by your um, focus on the PNR opinion because I think that raises many um, important questions. And I wonder, does it raise the big question, is there too much law in the EU's external relations? And I think particularly in contrast to other highly developed constitutional systems, the Court of Justice has never developed a differentiated or more deferential standard of review when it's looking at international agreements. <clears throat> Um, and the external relations field. And I wonder, do, you, do we see that in the PNR opinion and also the accession agreement to the ECHR opinion, where the court is in fact stepping on the toes of the executive negotiator and essentially engaging in an exercise that looks very much like the rewriting of these international agreements? And is there a risk in that of the court overreaching in such a way that might ultimately undermine the EU's normative influence internationally? Yeah, I think you're right, of course, that, that that's, that's a big issue. And, and in fact, the, I mean, I, I didn't mention human rights clauses partly for that reason. I, I think they're, you know, they, a lot of this is very rhetorical. Um, and in a way, what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to do in the chapter, which um, is, is, is really, is actually not talk so much about um, fundamental rights and values except at the at the end but talk about law 
in, a more, in its more mundane um, you know, economic law, um, uh, regulatory systems, and so on, um, where, where compliance is, uh, it takes different forms. But one aspect of this, which again, didn't have time to talk about today, but which I think is really interesting, is, is the work that Joanne's done, Joanne Scott's done on, on um, the, uh, on what she calls different forms of territorial extension. In other words, the way in which the EU's own reg regulatory standards apply in, t in third country territories. And the way in, w and, and there, you, you, there, are, there are ways, of course, of enforcement, um, including through, through concluding international agreements. Um, so I, I think that that's one aspect um, of this. So, Moving on swiftly, as David would have me do. Um, <laughs> David, I think, I think it's really, I, I, I think it's, it was a really interesting question because in a way, I, I would say, I, you know, Bruno de Vita wrote a, wrote a chapter in a, in, a, in a book I edited or we edited once where he said there was too much constitutional law, too much law in EU external relations. So he would probably agree with you. But... I would actually argue something a little bit different, which is that um, I think the court has been up till now extremely deferential in its, um, ex in its review of external relations in, one, in, in so far as it is concerned with policy choice. It does not interfere with the institution's policy choice at all, really, um, or has not up till now. Um, its review has been very much, and this is very much 213, um, on, on questions of um, institutional law and constitutional law, on the powers of the institutions, the relative powers of the member states, these, its own position as, a, as, as court, the autonomy principle, these, these guiding, this network of rules and principles, as it called them, in, in 213. So it's very strong at defending those, but it does not, on the whole, interfere with... Um, the concrete policy choices of the institutions. But what is then very interesting is, is I, as I said, the PNR case is the first case where you get a, a real substantive review um, of, if you like, those policy choices. But it's against the fundamental constitutional principle um, as the court sees it, including it's the, the, against the charter. So it's not saying, um, I mean, I... I, I I would say um, uh, that the, the, the court doesn't enter into at all the question of whether or not um, the EU should be signing these agreements. Um, it doesn't in the Polisario case say, you know, should the EU be negotiating these kinds of agreements with, uh, with third countries? Is this is the same in a way with the, its discussions on sustainable development? It doesn't, it doesn't question the political choices on, um, on you know, the kind of way in which the EU decides to incorporate sustainable development and, and so on. It, but what it does, what it is saying at, so far is if you're going to do these things, then you have to ensure that you comply with internal constitutional constraints. Um, yeah, principle pragmatism or principle, I, you know, I, I, as a lawyer, I, I struggle a little bit. Well, I, you know, it depends how you read these documents. This, this document is a rhetorical document. It's a rhetorical statement, which is, it, it, which is trying to square this circle and trying to, it's coming up with nice phrases to show that, in, to try and show that, that um, values and interests go together um, and that you can have principle pragmatism, you know. This, this, um, what it actually means in practice is anybody's guess, of course, and, and, and to some extent. I do think that, um, to, say, to say two words in its favour, I, th I think it is a genuine attempt to operationalise the mission statement, th the mission statement being Article 3.5. It's also, of course, a, a genuine attempt to try and cast a, uh, a sort of rational or coherent umbrella, policy umbrella, over diverse uh, policies of the European Union um, coming out of 
You know, it's, it's, it's interesting compared with the previous strategy in that it isn't only about the CFSP but covers trade and development and all sorts of other um, policies, climate change and so on. So there is, it definitely has a, co a coherence um, push behind it. So I don't, I don't want to um, be particularly cynical about it, but I, uh, you know, as a lawyer, these, the, it's probably not for me to say exactly what kind of um, uh, influence these kinds of policy statements have and what real traction they have. Um, Okay, I, I think there's two more people. I see Renault hiding in that back row. I think there's one other person there too. Are there any further questions from that back, from that back row, which I can't see very well? No. Okay. Let's. I'm going to try to stick to the front actually because we're running very low on time. So the people who came early will get to preference. Let's start in the corner here and question. We'll work our way across. We have a question hand. Back row is, is clear. Nobody in the back row has a question. Okay. We'll start on the side row in the back. Adrienne. Oh, you, sorry. Did you raise your hand? I'm sorry. Adrienne, please. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask you to maybe say a little bit more following up on Claire's question on the whole immigration and refugee issue, because I think, especially in the context of Africa, where the EU seems to be engaging much more and more, much more external action, and I'm very unclear about what legal constraints there are, if any, from within the EU. It seems to me it's a very good example of our interests, in a way, are, are, are kind of pursued, and, and I mean, I don't know how much respect for European values there is, but do you see a more general a challenge to the EU legal order through these types of activities for kind of the very overt promotion of interests that are very explicitly against European values, um, even, even to the non-lawyer, it seems that certain norms are clearly broken there. Maris, you mentioned the European Economic Area and the Ukraine uh, Agreement as examples for EU using international agreements as an instrument of foreign policy. But I think you could also have used the WTO Agreement uh, as a worldwide agreement with the EU as a member, influencing very much the adjudication and regulation in the WTO. And then there is an interesting question uh, uh, which arises. We have seen several instances in the WTO where the EU has persistently violated WTO law. You can even make now the argument that over the past two years, all WTO members have persistently violated their collective duty to maintain the appellate body as defined in Article 17, that is, as an appellate body composed of seven members and vacancies being filled as they arise. Currently, the appellate body has three members and the dispute settlement system is no longer functioning. So the interesting question is, uh, the Lisbon Treaty does not confer powers on the EU to violate international law. And uh, this is a deliberate choice. So uh, the EU is based on limited delegation of powers, but of course this is not, cannot be enforced by the European Court of Justice. Uh, so you mentioned the problem how to make this operation, uh, operational and also the advisory opinions which you mentioned are a very limited tool. Mm -hmm. But I mean, shouldn't we take the principle nonetheless serious and put the burden on the European Parliament and emphasize it is up to the European Parliament mm 
to assume its democratic responsibility to avoid the EU persistently violating international law and to protect the uh, transnational rule of law. Of course, I mean... Okay, no, no, it's, it's okay. Yeah, so in a way, I think there's a, there's a link between Adrienne's question and Uli's question. Um, I think, so Adrienne, you were saying what, what happens when, when there's a clash with, with, in a sense, you've got the EU promoting, uh, trying to influence or promoting its own regulatory model, uh, other powers trying to do the same. And I think absolutely, um, and, and one, could, one can think up um, examples of that. I, I, I think in a way part of uh, the EU's um, strategy in that context is to seek to influence um, norm making at, at, at a higher level. So um, it's, not, you know, it's not only its own norms that it's promoting, but it's also seeking to promote already existing norms, um, that, that norms which already exist at an, at an international level, but also to create new norms at an international level. So, um, but I, I, I agree, I mean, if you take the, I don't know, um, you can think of, one can think of examples, um, uh, geographical protection of origin or something like that, where the EU and the US are at odds and they're trying to, and, and, and that's where you see the, the bilateral agreements come in because the EU uses its bilateral agreements in a way to promote its own vision. Um, I, I think, um, and so in a, in a sense that links up with Bridget's point that, that this, um, this, uh, the EU as, a, as an external regulatory actor um, is is part of it, that that's part of the of, of the EU's geo, geopolitical power, and it would want to use its geopolitical power to promote this regulatory aspect of what of what of what it's doing, and to and to some extent vice versa. Um, so, I, I I think in a way, um, I, I I'm arguing that there is a specificity to the EU, but it is also of course operating. Um, in a in a world where there are other other actors that are that are playing the same game um, or as or a similar kind of game, um, and and so I think um, Uli's point is uh, I think what you're saying really uh, or what 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 I what what you seem to me to be saying was that. Um, that there is a there is a, a, a limit to the role that the, the court can play. Um, I mean, I I think, uh, and I uh, and that that's of course true. Cases have to get to the European Court. Um, the uh, there are rules about standing. There are rules about. I mean, the Turkey Agreement case a good example of how the court just said, no, nah, this has nothing to do with us because this was the member states and not us and not the EU and, and washed its hands um, in, a, in a not terribly um, edifying way, really. Um, but so there, there is clearly, there are clearly limits and I, uh, and I, the role of the parliament, yes, I mean, the role of the parliament is, is, a, is a political one um, and ultimate, I, I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't underestimate the importance of the uh, of the rulings of the of the ombudsman. The, the ombudsman's rulings are not binding. Um, they're not findings of illegality. They're findings of maladministration. But um, the commission purports to be a good administrator, and it, it is not insignificant when the ombudsman uh, tells the commission, as as it did in fact over the Turkey agreement. Um, the ombudsman said, not only should you be doing an impact assessment, should you have done an impact assessment in advance of the agreement, binding or not, um, but also you should be, um, insofar as the Commission is um, charged with implementation of the agreement, you should keep an ongoing watch on um, fundamental rights compliance in the implementation of the agreement. Now, this is not uh, legally binding, but it is, I, I think, uh, important in terms of the, 
administrative um, culture, if you like, within um, within EU the EU institutions. Um, I I'm not sure that I what I what I can what I really could say about migration and the migration policy because I think it's um, I I I think that it's it's really showing the problems that there are where where the um, in the, in the in, where, where you don't have I mean in, in in EU law you've got these references to international law and references to specifically also to the Geneva Conventions um, but but of course those provisions are not directly imported into um, into EU law in the ch in the Charter for example um, so it's it's a question of this is why I think the Polisario case is, is an interesting uh, very first step but it, it is only a very first step towards the idea that um, the rights of individuals in third countries and rights under international law is a legitimate uh, is something which the um, the um, policy making institutions the council and the and the Commission, and indeed the Parliament, in so far as it has um, has to give consent to international agreements, that they have a duty to take to take this into account. Um, I, it, it's these are very these are very sort of small movements, um, but they show that there is some potential there, which isn't to say that what the way things are at the moment and what's happening at the moment isn't isn't highly problematic. The question is how do how does one get a handle on 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 enforcing on compliance uh, on enforcing these things? And I think that's um, I I think the, the, the these mechanisms, compliance and enforcement mechanisms, are still struggling when it comes to enforcing international international law, law norms, particularly refugee law, within against the the EU itself. Yeah. Thanks. And it is now exactly 5.30, so I will invite everybody to go to the other room where I, I trust that there's a reception waiting for us. Thank you very much.